Hickman and Mr. Arthur Smith from the Environmental Technical Application Center, Air Weather Service, Military Airlift Command, will present this seminar. Throughout this seminar, we will be discussing cloud patterns and types. It is the understanding of these cloud patterns and types that enable us to make synoptic interpretations of meteorological features. For example, in this picture taken by a handheld Hasselblad camera from a Gemini satellite at about 150 miles altitude, we can see individual clouds that are easily recognizable. Fair weather cumulus, a few hundred yards in diameter. More important, we can see cloud patterns that reveal the meteorological situation. For instance, this is a sea breeze cloud pattern off the subcontinent of India. How do we know? We can see onshore flow along here and offshore flow here. I know this is elementary, but this is a good time to make a point about satellite photography. If you were in that fair weather area and making an observation, you might report clear in 15. But if you were to the south or southwest, you might report 6 or 7 eighths cumulus. At the surface, you'd be so close to the clouds, you wouldn't be able to see the whole sky dome. You wouldn't really know what was going on. From a satellite, the whole cloud pattern is there. Art? Yes, I think there's another elementary point we should put in right about now. What we're talking about here is horizontal and vertical motions in the atmosphere. Upward vertical motions forming the clouds, subsidence dissipating them, right? Right. The horizontal motions act as a sculptor does, forming the clouds into patterns, recognizable and typical patterns that tip us off as to what's going on in the Earth's atmosphere. Before we go more fully into cloud patterns as seen from a satellite, let's look briefly at the products of the different satellites, tools we'll be using. We have a series of satellites available to us. We have automatic picture transmission from APT satellites such as ESSA-6, ESSA-8, ITOS-1, and NOAA-1. This is an example of an APT product in which there are two orbits represented. These have been overlaid by hand. The important thing here is that we can see cloud patterns from a distance of some 700 nautical miles. Here, the cloud pattern indicates vorticity. These cloud patterns indicate vortices. Over in this region, a cloud pattern indicating a cold front. All these synoptic features and many others can be identified from these cloud patterns. This is an example from an ESSA-3 satellite which has an advanced Viticon camera system, AVCS. The photograph was taken from 800 nautical miles in space. Pictures like this one are received at Suitland, Maryland where the grid is superimposed by a computer. Again, we can see a considerable number of cloud patterns in this picture. For instance, this cloud pattern up here once again indicates vorticity. Cloud patterns out here indicating low-level cyclonic flow. A cloud pattern down here indicating a polar wind max. Going further out into space, out to some 19,000 nautical miles, we have an ATS-3 photograph. This picture, which is a classic in its time, shows approximately one-third of the world's weather from about 50 north to 50 south. Some of the more prominent land masses on this one photograph is the entire continent of South America, a portion of Africa, Central America, located beneath these clouds here. Our significant meteorological features, we find a funnel system in the northern hemisphere, a vortex in the vicinity of Gibraltar, clouds associated with the intertropical convergence zone, a large mass of thunderstorms over Brazil, fog, stratus, and stratocumulus off the west coast of South America, a frontal system in the southern hemisphere, and finally, a vortex in the southern hemisphere. Jerry? Now we have a special type of picture to show you, a picture we call a digitized product. AVCS pictures are similar to television pictures, as are all of our satellite pictures. In an AVCS picture, we have approximately 800 raster 
or scan lines. Since each scan line in an ABCS picture is an electronic signal, it can be broken down by a computer into approximately 800 bits of information. In meteorological slang, we call these brightness bits. Each brightness bit can be assigned to a locator in a computer program, an IJ locator. From this, we can reassemble these bits into a map form, polar stereographic maps or mercator projections and to any scale we need, 1 to 10 million or 1 to 20 million. The end result is a digitized and rectified product. In this particular digitized meteorological map, we can see a vortex, an included system, a cold front, a center of vorticity, a wave on the front, and low-level cyclonic flow. For the moment, so much for the satellites and their pictures. We've talked briefly about cloud patterns and earlier we mentioned cloud types. But how can we identify cloud types in a photograph taken some 750 nautical miles away? The answer is that we can use cloud patterns to identify cloud types. For example, in this Gemini picture of Florida, we can clearly see and identify fair weather cumulus over the land. No problem, right? Now, if we put the slide a little bit out of focus, we get a cloud pattern, we can no longer see the individual cumulus clouds. We can, however, make some inferences about this cloud pattern. First, its texture is grainy and uneven. And second, it occurs over the land mass. We can see that the pattern outlines the coast of Florida and Lake Okeechobee. From this, we should be able to rationalize that this is an orographic cloud pattern. More specifically, a diurnally produced cloud pattern consisting of cumulus or towering cumulus. On this slide, we can see the same pattern from a meteorological satellite photo that we saw on the previous slide when it was out of focus. Fair weather cumulus over the Yucatan Peninsula. There's the same grainy or uneven texture to the clouds, and of course, they are confined to the land. Climatology and time of day tell us that these clouds would be cumulus rather than stratus or stratocumulus. This brings out another point. When we look at satellite pictures to interpret cloud patterns, we must use all of our meteorological skills. Surface charts, upper air charts, continuity, time of day, climatology, and any other meteorological facts that come to hand. In other words, the satellite itself is a tool to be used along with our other meteorological tools. For example, here's another picture of a grainy cloud pattern. If you didn't use all your meteorological know-how, you might say that this was snow cover because of the river line. But when you consider the location near the equator at 20 degrees east, you know that you're looking at the Congo River Valley. These are clouds and not snow. This is a typical picture of fair weather cumulus clouds with clouds forming over the warm land and not over the cooler river or lakes. The water and land temperatures may differ only a few degrees, but as you know, that's all it takes to form a cloud under these circumstances. So much for fair weather cumulus. How can we identify cumulonimbus from a satellite? This well-formed cloud is an individual cumulonimbus cell, about 40 miles in diameter. The picture was taken from Apollo 9 over Columbia, South America. You can visualize the upward vertical motion forming the cloud, and you can see the subsidence along the edge of the cell. There are two particular details to remember about this remarkable picture. One, it has a sharp edge where the subsidence is most apparent, and two, a fuzzy edge where the anvil cirrus is advected downstream and obscures the sharp edge of the cell. In this satellite picture, we have the same type of cloud. Notice the sharp edge and the fuzzy edge. 
These are the identifying characteristics of a cumulonimbus type of cloud on a satellite picture. Before we go to the next satellite picture, we want to make a particularly important point. It's a rule of thumb we all know, but it's a rule we must be constantly aware of. Identify the cloud level. How can we do this using satellite photography? Can we do this in satellite photography using cumulonimbus? The answer is yes. Here's an example. Look at this cloud pattern east of Florida. Find the cumulonimbus clouds by identifying those clouds with a sharp edge and a fuzzy edge. The winds east of Florida at the cirrus level are obviously from the northwest. But here we have a line of ropey cumulus which is related to low-level wind flow. In other words, at this location, we have low-level cyclonic flow and high-level anticyclonic flow. Our low-level and high-level wind directions, along with the cumulonimbus activity, allow us to identify this as a tropical storm east of Florida. Cumulonimbus cloud patterns give themselves away by having a sharp edge and a fuzzy edge. And among other things, they allow us to determine wind flow at the cirrus level. Incidentally, this particular slide is from an infrared satellite display. We want to take a good look at open and closed cellular patterns. Open and closed convective cellular patterns were first described in the 19th century by Baynard, a French scientist, under laboratory research conditions. Satellite photographs provide evidence of these patterns existing in our atmosphere. Mr. Smith can tell us some of the many uses we can make of these cloud patterns. Art? Let's begin with the open cellular cloud pattern. When you see an open cellular cloud pattern, you are looking at cumulus clouds, towering cumulus, and occasionally cumulonimbus. Open cellular cloud patterns have cloudy walls and clear centers. They are associated with cyclonic flow and with cooler air over a warmer water source, usually the ocean. But they may be seen over land as well. They are most commonly seen in the cold air advection behind a polar front, but they may also occur in lower latitudes. Here is an example of an open cellular cloud pattern over both the land and water. Here we have open cells over northern Europe. Here we have open cells forming over the North Sea. This is a closed cellular cloud pattern. When we identify this pattern, we are looking at stratocumulus clouds. Compare the stratocumulus clouds in this region to the cumulonimbus clouds in this region. The cumulonimbus clouds have sharp and fuzzy edges, with the stratocumulus clouds no sharp and fuzzy edges. Closed cellular cloud patterns have clear walls and cloudy centers and they are an excellent indication of anticyclonic wind flow. Both open and closed patterns are created by heating from below, but the air-sea temperature differential is not as great in closed cellular clouds. We want to emphasize that the open cellular cloud pattern is a good indicator of cyclonic flow, and the closed cellular cloud pattern is a good indicator of anticyclonic flow. In addition, a closed cellular cloud pattern is capped by a subsidence inversion, while the convection of the open cellular cloud pattern is restrained by dry air entrainment. Stratus and small stratocumulus clouds have a smooth, silky appearance and may terminate abruptly. For example, this is stratus and or stratocumulus off the coast of California. Silky in appearance, but terminating abruptly at the mountains. This is fog in the San Joaquin Valley of California, and this is the way fog will always look like in a valley. Typically silky in appearance, but with the edges terminating abruptly along the valley walls. Up to this point, we've been talking about low-level clouds and vertically developed clouds. Now let's discuss middle clouds. We do not identify middle clouds from satellite photographs as frequently as we do low and high level clouds. Middle clouds usually occur with large scale synoptic systems such as fronts and vortices. 
Here we have middle clouds associated with an occluded front. The key to the identification of middle clouds is being able to identify the synoptic situation. This is a frontal band. Only part of it is topped by cirrus. Where it is topped by cirrus, it has that silky, tenuous appearance. Where it is not topped by cirrus, we see highlights and shadows in the middle clouds. Now let's look at the effect of lower clouds under a cover of cirrus. Where there are clouds beneath the cirrus, the silky pattern is bright and has a high albedo. Where there are no clouds beneath the cirrus, the cirrus has a grayer appearance, giving the impression of being semi-transparent. Jerry? We have, up to now, briefly reviewed types of clouds. Stratiform, cumuliform, and cirriform. We've emphasized the importance of identifying cloud level by recognition of cloud types, and we have touched upon identifying wind flow at these cloud levels. Now we want to point out some additional features that are frequently seen in satellite meteorological photographs. This is a picture of anomalous cloud lines. We suspect they are a type of low-level contrail caused by passing ships, the smokestack effluent providing the nuclei for condensation. We don't know a whole lot about anomalous cloud lines, but what we do know is that they are stratocumulus clouds associated with high pressure at the surface. They occur in a stable, moist air mass with a subsidence inversion. This is another extra feature we sometimes pick up in satellite photography mountain wave clouds. For mountain wave clouds to be seen in satellite pictures, certain criteria must exist in the atmosphere. Wind speed must be at least 25 knots at mountain top level. Winds must be nearly perpendicular to the mountain ridge lines. The atmosphere must be dynamically stable, and wind speed must increase with height. Winds in this example would be greater than 25 knots from approximately 280 degrees. This would also be an area of possible turbulence. This picture of mountain wave clouds, along with what we call cap clouds, was taken from a Gemini satellite. Air masses moving over water and around islands will give certain telltale signs that can mean a good deal to the meteorologist. For instance, small-scale eddy patterns that often occur downwind of islands. They are mechanically induced small-scale vortices forming in fields of stratocumulus clouds. In this satellite picture, the eddies in the stratocumulus field are downwind of the Canary Islands. Low-level winds are generally between 10 and 15 knots when the eddies are evident. In satellite meteorological photographs, clouds show up comparatively white, but so does snow. And the last feature we want to bring to your attention in this part of the seminar is snow cover. This is an example of what we call a dendritic snow pattern located over the western United States and Canada. The snow is most apparent on the higher elevations in the mountains and is not seen in the valleys because of shadows or the absence of snow. This is, this is an Apollo picture of a dendritic snow pattern over the Himalayas. Notice the clouds in the lower part of the picture and compare them to the snow texture. Depending on the terrain, the season, and the wind, snow can take on many different patterns and textures. In this picture, the snow lies thickly on the ice pack of Hudson Bay. From point B northward, we have a picture of snow cover on tundra. From point B southward to Lake Winnipeg at point F, we have the mottled pattern of snow over scrub vegetation and farmland. At points C, D, and E, the snow has been blown from the trees in a pine forest, the trees giving a darker appearance than the snow-covered lower terrain. Art, have we covered everything on snow cover? I think one other important point is the use of continuity as a helpful tool in uh, differentiating between snow cover and cloud cover. For instance, if you look at the same area for two or three days in a row, 
you'll notice that the cloud patterns will tend to change from day to day, whereas your basic snow field will remain relatively constant throughout the entire period. Yeah, that is a good point. Continuity is a helpful tool in identifying snow. Clouds seldom retain the same shape or location for more than a few hours, whereas non-changing patterns are indicative of snow cover. Rivers, lakes, and mountains can often be identified in a snow field, while a cloud shield over snow usually obscures these landmarks. In this seminar, we have briefly reviewed cloud patterns and cloud types. The synoptic application of these cloud patterns is pretty much what satellite meteorology is all about, but that's another story. As meteorologists, it is your responsibility to be able to identify cloud patterns and cloud types, and to be able to interpret their forms in terms of atmospheric movement. The better you understand cloud patterns, the more accurately you will be able to integrate satellite data with other meteorological information to produce improved analyses and forecasts. example of an open cellular cloud pattern over both the land and water. Here we have open cells over northern Europe. Here we have open cells forming over the North Sea. This is a closed cellular cloud pattern. When we identify this pattern, we are looking at stratocumulus clouds. Compare the stratocumulus clouds in this region to the cumulonimbus clouds in this region. The cumulonimbus clouds have sharp and fuzzy edges, with the stratocumulus clouds no sharp and fuzzy edges. Closed cellular cloud patterns have clear walls and cloudy centers, and they are an excellent indication of anticyclonic wind flow. Both open and closed patterns are created by heating from below, but the air-sea temperature differential is not as great in closed cellular clouds. We want to emphasize that the open cellular cloud pattern is a good indicator of cyclonic flow and the closed cellular run. All these synoptic features and many others can be identified from these cloud patterns. This is an example from an ESA-3 satellite which has an advanced Viticon camera system, AVCS. The photograph was taken from 800 nautical miles in space. Pictures like this one are received at Suitland, Maryland, where the grid is superimposed by a computer. Again, we can see a considerable number of cloud patterns in this picture. For instance, this cloud pattern up here once again indicates vorticity. Cloud patterns out here indicating low-level cyclonic flow. A cloud pattern down here indicating a polar wind max. Going further out into space, out to some 19,000 nautical miles, we have an ATS-3 photograph. This picture, which is a classic in its time, shows approximately one-third of the world's weather, from about 50 north to 50 south. Some of the more prominent land masses on this one photograph is the entire continent of South America, a portion of Africa, Central America, located beneath these clouds here. Our significant meteorological features we find a funnel system in the northern hemisphere, a vortex in the vicinity of Gibraltar, clouds associated with the intertropical convergence zone, a large mass of thunderstorms over Brazil, fog, stratus, and stratocumulus off the west coast of South America, a funnel system in the southern hemisphere, and finally, a vortex in the southern hemisphere. Jerry? Now we have a special type.